Welcome everyone to the fantasy and betting podcast presented by the 33rd team. I'm your host as always, Josh Larkey, joined as always by my co-host Ryan Reynolds. For this week 16 Thursday show, we are going to walk through some of my fantasy rankings and players I have quite a bit above and below consensus and why. Then I'm going to discuss the MVP race and get Ryan's thoughts on it. Ryan is most likely the sharpest MVP better that's out there that you've ever, you've ever heard of. And we want to get his thoughts because the race is unique. And uh, then we'll close the show out discussing the NFC playoff picture. We discussed AFC last week and we'll dive into how these NFC teams stack up. It is a world of very, very elite teams and mediocrity. So we'll, we'll dive in to that shortly. Ryan, I'll turn it over to you. Let's chat some rankings. One more week, Josh. We get through this week. We get to the fantasy championships. Let's let's talk about some matchups you have here. First up, streamer. Big game last week. You have Baker Mayfield as quarterback eight. Consensus has him as quarterback 12. Tell us about Baker, Josh. Baker Mayfield's played really well all year when it comes to just stats, which is what we want for fantasy football. He's pacing for over 4,000 pass yards, nearly 30 passing touchdowns. He's reached 16 fantasy points, seven of his past nine games. The two misses in those past nine games were the Niners and the Panthers. Both of them are actually uh, bottom four for fantasy points allowed to quarterbacks when adjusting for schedule. So those are two of the four toughest matchups. He didn't get there. That's okay. We forgive you, Baker. He's reached 20 fantasy points the past two games. The Buccaneers are in the driver's seat for the NFC South right now. We'll, We'll talk about that more later. And then when we look at the matchup, the Jaguars' pass defense has struggled overall this year. Quarterbacks are scoring nearly three fantasy points above their season average against the Jaguars. And Baker's averaged over 17 fantasy points. So uh, the rough napkin math puts him around 20 fantasy points. I'm not saying he's legally required to score 20, but I think the floor and ceiling are both good enough. And the, the overall quarterback landscape's weak enough this week that he's my quarterback eight. Agreed. I'm not a big Baker Mayfield guy, but I think this is a above average matchup for him as well. Consensus has Chuba Hubbard as running back 22, Josh. You have him as running back 16. Tell us why. Well, post Frank Reich era. So once they fired the head coach, it was not the Miles Sanders show. It's been the Chuba Hubbard show, at least 22 carries each of those games. This pass offense is atrocious. It's the worst in the NFL. They've been under 200 passing yards, seven straight games. They have two total passing touchdowns the past seven games. The matchup against the Packers, they're a run funnel defense. Running backs are scoring two fantasy points a game higher than the season-long average when they face the Packers. That's ninth best. Overall, they're allowing 105 rush yards a game, so it's coming a lot of the production on the ground specifically. That's Chuba's wheelhouse. He's the guy getting 22 carries or more each game. Those 105 rush yards a game, that's fourth most. We've seen Chuba with at least 11 and a half fantasy points the past three games, a high watermark right now of 22 and a half those past three games. So we know that the floor is decent. Ceiling's quite good. At the end of the day, at least 24 touches, at least 96 total yards and three straight in this new coaching era. And he's got a great matchup. That's Jay Larky tweets. You can find his fantasy rankings up on the website Tuesday afternoons. Kev Wheeler, Matthew Hill pitch in their own rankings. I throw in some defenses for the good people. Next up, James Conner. You have met running back 14. Consensus has him as running back 25. I liked him last week. Curious what you're thinking here now. Yeah, it's funny that, Ryan, we've sort of become James Conner enthusiasts compared to the, the market. Week 13 against the Steelers, he carried 25 times, over 100 rushing yards, two touchdowns on the ground, and he had two targets. Week 14, they had the bye. And then week four, 15 against the Niners. Niners had some injuries on the defensive line. And Connor took advantage. 14 carries, 86 yards, and a touchdown. Three more targets chipped in. The Bears are the seventh best matchup for opposing running backs when you adjust for who they have faced. And the Cardinals are almost certainly without Marquise Brown. I would expect a run-heavy game plan once again. They, they've been reasonably effective the, these past two games with this run-heavy approach. I don't see why it would stop here. Minnesota finally got a 100-yard rusher last week, Josh. Wasn't Alexander Madison, who you hate, he was out. Ty Chandler got the shot. He made it work. You have met running back 17. Consensus has him as running back 23. What are you thinking here? So, Ryan, for all the people listening out there, let's just, everyone close your eyes for a second, unless you're driving. Would you like a running back that has a 4-3-8-40 time and gets literally all the touches in his backfield? 
because I certainly would. And that is Ty Chandler. He had 23 of 24 running back carries last week. He had all four running back targets. That is 27 opportunities. My goodness. All he did was turn it into 157 total yards. He scored. He had nearly 25 fantasy points. Some out there, they're worried. They see the red ink in the matchup column. They're like, oh, did you know the Lions are tough against running backs? Well, when we adjust for schedule, you want to know who else is tough against running backs? The Bengals, who we faced last week, have actually uh, really uh, shut down running backs compared to expectation. He did just fine. Guys, 157 total yards against them last week. Ryan, you've talked a few times about how you like the Vikings offensive line. I like the weapons in the past game to keep Detroit's defense honest. When you have Justin Jefferson, TJ Hawkins, and Jordan Addison, you can't stack the box against Chandler. I, I think he breaks a couple of big runs, and I think he scores you 15, 20 fantasy points. Next up, you have Saquon Barkley at running back 29. Clearly, you're not a big fan of him at this point. His consensus has him at running back 18. Tell the good people why. So the, these past six games with Tommy DeVito have been tough. He's had three top nine matchups for fantasy running backs, the Raiders, the Commanders, the Packers. He hit 14 fantasy points or more each game. Congrats, Saquon. You did what you're supposed to do. The problem is he's had three tougher matchups in that span with DeVito. The Cowboys, the Patriots, the Saints. He was under eight fantasy points every game. The Eagles are the worst matchup for fantasy running backs. The Giants are also 10-point underdogs, so we might not see that many Saquon runs. And you might be like, that's okay. He's a, he's a pass catcher. Yes, he, he was a pass catcher against the Commanders. He was the RB1 that week overall. It was awesome. Four catches, 57 yards, two touchdowns. But when it's not the Commanders, when it's not the NFL's worst defense, those other five games with DeVito, he's averaged two catches for 12 receiving yards. I, I simply don't see a, a reasonable path to the ceiling, but I, I see a lot of ways where he gives you seven fantasy points and hurts your team this week. I'm going to tack on that real quick, Josh. First, Philly's going to own a gap defensively. So if Saquon's going to have any success, it's probably going to be in the passing game. And like we've discussed a few times, I'll be spending Christmas with two adult Eagle fans, four, four minors that are Eagle fans. You know, my little niece will come over to me and tell me Giants suck because her dad said that. But, you know, my, my destiny this Christmas is to watch the Giants get blown out, Josh. That's uh, just the reality of the situation. <laughs> you have DeAndre Hopkins, a wide receiver 15. Consensus has him as wide receiver 23. I'm very, very curious why you're above market on him. Yeah, Hopkins had a slow start to the season. He changed teams, but he's really been rolling since week five. The first four games, couldn't really put it together. Week five onward, he's averaging eight and a half targets, 70 receiving yards a game, 140 air yards a game during that span, and 15 fantasy points a game. That's all pretty solid past three games he's had 12 12 and then nine targets for 184 171 and 200 air yards we we might not get quite as many air yards this week we're switching from will levis to ryan Tannehill, but Tannehill should provide stability he should provide accuracy the seahawks are a well above average matchup for fantasy receivers and it's not even that i love hopkins necessarily it's just that when you look at the state of the receiver position with so many quarterback injuries Hopkins actually has one of just the better situations and better roles for this week. Interesting tidbit for you here. Um, I have eight or nine teams that are advancing to week 16 in best ball tournaments. Three of them have Ryan Tannehill. Isn't, isn't that crazy? I like that. That's uh, I have to dive into my portfolio more to figure it out. I have no BBM teams, unfortunately, but we got like six puppies, I think four or five big boards and then a few rookies and sophomores. So we, we, we both have some action going on. I, I would love to have a Tannehill team at this point. Yeah, yeah it's interesting. I have him with Traylon Burks as Kev, Kev Wheeler here. Is, uh, I hope you're right, pal. I hope, I hope the sky's the limit. Now, the next one here, I think this is a major decision for a lot of people. You have Garrett Wilson at wide receiver 27. Consensus has him at wide receiver 21. The commanders are the, are the best matchup any wide receiver can get. What are you thinking here? Ryan, it's unfortunate. I think if there was an offense not equipped to take advantage of the commanders, it would be the Jets. Zach Wilson yeah. is still in concussion protocol. When we look at weeks 12, 13, and 15, those are the weeks that Garrett Wilson had a combo of either Tim Boyle or Trevor Simeon at quarterback. Wilson averaged seven targets, four catches, 41 yards a game. That's 10 fantasy points a game. That's just not exciting. It doesn't get me out of bed in the morning. I, I don't really see where this massive ceiling comes from, but I can definitely see the floor here. So... Uh, let me let me know if you if you're if you think I'm off base here, but I, I would imagine what like the the Chargers, Jets, are kind of the uh, or the Chargers and the Patriots are yeah Jets right those are like the, the three offenses right now we know 
can't really take advantage of anyone at this point. No, I think you're right. I think you framed it wonderfully that I know what the floor is and the floor is horrifying. I, I think I'd play him in most situations just because just because of the matchup. And, you know, if he got 50 percent of the targets in this game, it wouldn't really stun me. But it, it, it is it is not a slam dunk. It's it's actually like really unfortunate because if Aaron Rodgers is the quarterback here, Garrett Wilson might be your wide receiver one this week. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Next up, Jordan Addison. You have him as wide receiver 31. Consensus has him as wide receiver 25. Just because of you know crowded target shares here. What, what, what do you think? What are we thinking here? Yeah, so they had the buy in week 13. We've had Jefferson back these past two games. Week 14, Jordan Addison had three targets. That's nine percent of the team's targets that week. That's terrible. He caught two passes for 27 yards. He had 22 air yards, so he wasn't running very far down the field, and he didn't do anything. Week 15, he had six targets, 53 air yards. None of none of that is sexy. What we really like is that he caught all six targets for 111 yards and two touchdowns. There were a lot of broken plays that led to the big yardage. I didn't really see anything out of Addison's role that gets me excited because when we zoom out, he is the third option in the pass game behind Justin Jefferson, behind TJ Hawkinson, with Nick Mullins at quarterback and a very uh, good rushing attack right now with Ty Chandler. So if he's going to be behind three other players, in terms of offensive role, then even with the Lions as the matchup, I just have to zoom out and recognize that the floor here is pretty low because we, we've we looked at three and six targets the past two weeks, not very far down the field. Next up, you have Jacoby Myers as wide receiver 39. Consensus has him as wide, wide receiver 32. I definitely agree with you here. Looking forward to what you have to say, though. So Jimmy Garoppolo uh, hung around through the first eight weeks of the season. It's been the Aiden O'Connell show from week nine onward. Jacoby Myers with Aiden O'Connell since week nine. Oh boy. Under five targets a game. Three and a half catches for 41 receiving yards a game. Really? We're starting that guy? Under nine fantasy points, four of his past seven games. He's only reached 14 fantasy points once in the past seven. It's not like the Chiefs are a good matchup. They're actually the fifth worst matchup for receivers when you adjust for schedule. I think anyone that's watched football this year has noticed that the Chiefs defense is carrying this team. And I, I really just don't understand why we we should in any way like the second pass game option on a team that's going to run the stink out of the ball with Josh Jacobs returning. I like it. You know, you, you're down on Saquon Barkley this week, but you're above consensus in Darren Waller. You have him as tight end 10. The, the field has him as tight end 13. Where are you at here, Josh? Yeah, uh, this is just for you and the Giants fans, Ryan. They, <laughs> they've, been, they've, been getting, um, they've been getting to me a little bit. They're oh. living rent-free in the head. I understand they're frustrated that I don't like Saquon. This one's for you guys. So with Darren Waller, he had six targets last week. He caught four for 40 yards, returning from injury. And I think some people out there look and they go, well, that's not very good because did you see how many targets Darius Slayton had? Darius Slayton had eight. Yes, Darius Slayton had more targets than Waller. Darius Slayton also ran 44 routes to Waller's 22. Wondell Robinson ran 43 routes to Waller's 22. They were easing Waller back in last week from injury, but he was tar- Waller was targeted on 27% of his routes. That was by far the highest on the team. I, I think the, the six targets last week are most likely the floor in this game with his usage because that Eagles pass rush is going to overwhelm the Giants. Waller's average depth of target was only five yards downfield last week. Eagles in general are the 10th best matchup for fantasy tight ends. All signs point to a lot of Darren Waller targets. If you're uh, listening to this right now and you're still alive in your fantasy playoffs, hop in our Discord. We'll be answering start quit, start sit questions now and through the weekend. I'll hop in in a couple hours for any Thursday night specific questions in particular. I have one for you, Josh. Uh, I have a $500 entry team. I have uh, I'm in the semifinal or you know whatever this is semifinals one game left to get the get the ship. I'm playing a guy. I I think I have the best team in the league. I think he has second. We're projected to be even here. I have to decide between Kyler Murray and Matthew Stafford. I'm going to run by you my team here real quick though, if you don't mind. I have McCaffrey. I have Kamara. I have Waddle. I have Olave. I'm going to have to play JSN or Gabe Davis or Josh Downs probably. That's a decision I have. Trey McBride's in the lead over Dalton Kincaid or Dallas Goddard. Um, DeAndre Swift's the flex probably over Jalen Warden. I think I'm going to go Packers over Cowboys defensively, and I'm going to figure it out on kicker later in the week. Would you play Stafford over Murray? 
with with two caveats. They have Kyron Williams, and I already have two players playing tonight. Yeah, I would just roll with Matthew Stafford. So Stafford is one of two quarterbacks who has at least 250 passing yards and multiple passing touchdowns the past three games. It's him and Joe Flacco. That's kind of fun. Kyler Murray will be playing without Marquise Brown, most likely. He hasn't practiced yet this week due to a heel injury. And as we've discussed a couple of times, the Chicago defense has actually really shut down pass attacks in recent weeks. I I have them close, Stafford and Kyler, but I, I do lean Stafford. We'll, we'll kind of see how that ages with uh, the kickoff happening in four and a half hours. But <laughs> ultimately, Kyler's been below 16 fantasy points back to back weeks. Kind of makes sense that this pass attack just has been incredibly inefficient. It's pretty much just McBride, who I have as my fantasy tight end one this week. So I love that you get to start him. He's just a, a target monster right now. But at the end of the day, when you look at quarterback, do you really want to trust Kyler when his top option is Trey McBride and his number two option is probably Michael Wilson, who failed to record a catch last week? No, I, I don't. <laughs> I don't. Let's talk about something a little less depressing than uh, Kyler Murray with literally no weapons. So yeah, I guess to, to recap, folks, uh, I would recommend starting Stafford. Ryan, let's turn to the MVP discussion. I'm looking at DraftKings, Sportsbook. We're going to get some odds for some of these players. We've got that big Monday night game. We'll talk about that more in a little bit, that Ravens-Niners game. Massive implications for the MVP. Massive implications for who the Super Bowl favorite will likely be. But before we get to that, let's talk about some of these mid-range candidates. Dak Prescott is 7-1. to one. Josh Allen is 12-1. to one. So we've got those two intermediate quarterbacks. Then we've got some long shots. Jalen Hurts at 20 to 1. Tyreek Hill and his ankle sprain, they've fallen. He's now 25 to 1. Patrick Mahomes has been a game manager this year. He's at 25 to 1. Tua Tagovailoa is at 28 to 1. Do you have any interest in any of these six options right now? Yeah, I'm not sure from a betting perspective that I want to bet on any of them, but I think Tua's done. I think Mahomes is basically done. I actually think Tyreek's close to done because he missed the game. He's probably not going to get 2,000 yards. And if Cooper Cup didn't win a couple years ago, he only got one vote. I don't think, you know, Hill, especially with some of his off-field stuff, is going to, you know, climb the ladder here. Still very live in Offensive Player of the Year, though. Um, Jalen Hurts has one path, and that is if every other contending team loses and he goes nuts the last three weeks and the Eagles end up as the number one seed, he's not completely dead, but I think that's pretty thin. Um Josh Allen, I, I've talked about him a few times. Uh, I don't think he quite gets there, in part because he only had 94 passing yards last week. So Buffalo's red hot tear here isn't entirely reliant on him. And on top of that, the number one a quarterback on the number one seed wins just about every year. In the last 10 years, it's only happened in one time where the two seed, a quarterback from the two seed won. So I don't think Allen's competitive there really. And I, I do think Dak's still alive. Uh, he needs some help here, you know. I think if the Ravens beat San Francisco, that helps Dak. But, you know, the Cowboys are going to have to win out from here. And But from a producti productivity standpoint, Dak still, is still in the mix. Guys, that's Ryan Reynolds, NFL on Twitter. His expert picks and predictions for every game are on the 33rdteam.com. They came out today, Thursday. Tomorrow, the two of us and our data scientist, Ahan Rungta, will be doing the player prop happy hour. And in... Uh, maybe like 36 hours on the site, maybe a little less. We'll have exactly what Ryan is betting on in each and every game. We understand folks. There's two games Saturday afternoon and night, a bevy of games on Sunday. And then those three Christmas games, we're going to get you all ready for those. All right. Let's talk about the main event for MVP. Brock Purdy is in the driver's seat. And then some, he is minus 200 minus 200. Uh, for those out there that want to convert that into probability odds, the sports books right now are kind of saying he has a two thirds chance to win. Lamar Jackson second at plus 450, so four and a half to one. And then Christian McCaffrey is 10 to one, by far the most productive running back overall this year. How do you see these three fitting in? So productivity-wise, Lamar has been off the pace all year. He hasn't really even been all that close. That said, he goes in and beats the 49ers on, on Monday Night Football this week and then beats the Dolphins the next week while having two big spike games. He's not dead. He has a path in that situation, but those those two things need to happen. Um, Purdy's been at the top of, you know, efficiency metrics all year, you know, at least most of the year. I know, uh, I've recommended him at 20 plus odds, 20 to one plus odds at two different intervals here. So definitely don't want to bet him. I don't think he's a lock though. And here, here's why 
No MVP quarterback has ever had a teammate that led the league in rushing yards. Christian McCaffrey currently leads the league in rushing yards by 324 yards, I believe it is. He's also leading all running backs in receiving yards, too. So, And then on top of that, the 49ers also have are giving up the second fewest points per game this season. So uh, it's, it's, a, it's a bit of a conundrum. It's a bit like Stafford in a couple, couple years ago where Stafford fell off. But how do you pick an MVP on this team when two guys are in the mix? I, I, don't, I don't think he's a slam dunk. Although, mm. from an efficiency standpoint and all that, he's absolutely having an MVP year. He's been great. But I, I actually think CMC has a real shot here. That's what I was about to ask you. So I know that a month and a half ago you recommended Dak at forty to one. You've recommended Purdy at twenty to one. Would you say that at this point CMC? It not that we're recommending anyone bet on this today, but if someone said what what's your favorite odds wise, would it be Dak or CMC? It seems like those are the two you have the most interest in right now. Yeah, I, I don't really want to bet. One of the things I do is I just don't bet on skill players in this market. I did bet on McCaffrey and Offensive Player of the Year when when Hill got hurt. But uh, I would say it's not long enough for me, but I genuinely think that he has a very real shot to, to win to win here because the 49ers just have such a great supporting cast, and that's like a real legitimate gripe with any party candidacy. I like it. Let's turn to the NFC playoff picture. Right now, when we look at the wild cards for the six and seven seeds, and that's uh, just because the Eagles and Cowboys are going to ping pong between division lead and the five seed. We've got the Vikings and Rams. They are currently in at seven and seven. The Rams play the Saints tonight. Then uh, a couple of teams that are really close. The Seahawks are also seven and seven. They're losing the tiebreaker. They had that nice upset win over the Eagles. Then we 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 should mention that the Packers at six and eight are also uh, technically still alive. Vikings, Rams, Seahawks, Packers. If you had to choose two right now, I'm guessing one of them is Stafford's Rams. But let me know what you're thinking here. Yeah, I think it's Stafford, Rams, and I think it's going to be Seattle. You know, Seattle has Tennessee, Pittsburgh, Arizona left. That's at least two and one, if not three and three. I think Minnesota is going to fall off. I think last week's loss was was kind of a killer for them. They have the Lions twice and the Packers. I could legitimately see them losing all three of those games. Um, and the Packers blew their shot, you know, losing to the Giants and then the Bucks. I, I think they're done. Uh, so, yeah, for me, out of that group, Rams, Seahawks. The NFC South, the Saints and Bucks are seven and seven. Bucks currently hold that tiebreaker. They beat the Saints earlier this year, but they do play each other in week 17. Arthur Smith's Falcons. I don't think we need to talk about them too much, but we should acknowledge they are six and eight, the worst managed team right now in the NFL. Do the, the Saints have any shot if they beat the Rams tonight? Yes, they do, especially because they they uh they play the Bucks in week 17 and then they play the Falcons in week 18, I believe. I mean, they have the better team, but, you know, the Buccaneers have just hung around. They've hung around. And I think you said that Trevor Lawrence hasn't practiced. So, well, he's probably going to play if he can because they, they're in. You know, I, in I was going to say, I, I adjusted my fantasy rankings today with the breaking news. I do not think Lawrence plays because he officially didn't practice in any capacity today. It is Thursday, and it becomes very, very thin at this point for him to get two practices in. So I, I I do not believe he plays now, unfortunately. Yeah, I mean, if he doesn't play, I think the Buccaneers win the division. If he does play, I think the Jaguars are going to beat Tampa. So that's that's an interesting conundrum here. I don't think the Saints are going to – I think the Saints are going to give the Rams a game. I think they're going to cover, but I don't think they're going to win. And that's a shame because they had the easiest schedule in the league. They uh, I think they're going to blow it, basically, if Beathard plays tonight for the Jaguars – or Sunday for the Jaguars. Yeah, we were really bullish on the Saints in terms of win-loss record this year. When yeah. I did my strength of schedule metric this off season, Saints had the easiest schedule. Falcons had the second easiest schedule and no team was within like 10, 15% of those two. You can just look at the quarterbacks they faced Falcons, Saints, ridiculously easy time. And yet the, the bucks have, have taken it. Let's look at the, the division leaders, lions, Niners, anything to add here? You think the Niners get the one seed? Where do you think the, the lions finish? Yeah. I mean, in power rankings, I've had the Lions at eighth because, in part, you know that's what their Super Bowl odds have been because that's where they belong. You know they're they haven't you know they beat the Chiefs by one point. You know we've talked about this a number of times. Chiefs were without Chris Jones and Travis Kelsey. Kadarius Tony dropped a five yard drag, tipped off his hands, and the Lions returned it for a touchdown. I don't really call that the Lions beating them. You know, and they haven't really beaten anyone else. Good offense, really good offensive line. You know, defense has been getting shredded for the most part. So. 
if they played Dallas in the first round, I think they'd lose. The fact that they're going to play Seattle or the Rams, I could see them losing too in that scenario, honestly. This one's interesting. Eagles, Cowboys, atop the division. Who do you think actually wins this division? Because the Eagles have lost three straight, but I will say their schedule is definitely easier than the Cowboys to close out the year. Yeah, I mean, they get the Giants twice and they get the Cardinals, so I think the, the Eagles are going to win out. And Dallas, you know, I, I who do they get? They get Miami this week. Then they already just the played Lions. Buffalo. They, play the they get Lions. the Lions week 17, yeah. You know, I actually think that I actually think Dallas is going to win out too. I think Philly is going to have the tiebreaker. I think once they once they beat the Giants and the Cardinals, or I should say, if so, I think they're both going to end up thirteen and four. But the Eagles have the tiebreaker, I believe. Folks, Ryan Reynolds, NFL on Twitter. Make sure you're checking out his work on the thirty third team dot com. Ryan, let's close out the show with some score predictions for our marquee Christmas night game: the 49ers and the Ravens. You and I, we we talked pre-show. We found out we're within one point for our score predictions. Yeah. <laughs> we both have the the Niners winning. I had it 24-17. You had it 24-16. Talk to me about what you're seeing here since the way I, th- I saw it is that the, the Niners offense has too many ways to beat you. I don't think it, I think I, I don't really care that the, the Ravens have been playing good defense. When you look at the yeah. teams that they have done well against, they look nothing like the Niners. And I'm hoping, hoping the Niners defense is a little bit healthier this week than last week. What do you want to add here? Yeah, I just, you know, I think if the 49ers lose, it's basically going to be because Brock Purdy has multiple interceptions. I think that's like the re- most realistic path. Uh, I'd be very surprised if Lamar Jackson just destroyed the 49ers defense because their front's so good. They're going to be able to spy him freely. So he's going to basically have to beat them over the top. And, you know, he's capable of that. But it's not exactly something I want to go out of my way to bet against either. Folks, from myself, Josh Larkey, from my co-host, Ryan Reynolds, from the 33rd team, from that marquee Ravens-Niners matchup on Christmas night, happy holidays, Merry Christmas. Thank you, everyone.